How exciting that you are here to help us observe the International Day of Remembrance of the Rwandan Genocide. This particular event is very special for all of us here. It's because this event involves one of our own. We are going to hear from our very own Felix Hagenimana, and he has brought his wonderful colleague, Emmanuel Mugwara Karama, here to speak to us today about remembering Rwanda. Let me start this program just by saying a few things about survival. Bearing witness. <coughs> Recognizing injustice, exuding hope in humanity, and most importantly, speaking truth to power. That's what today's event is about. And let's reflect just a little bit on speaking truth to power. This does not mean the absence of fear. It does not mean fearless. It means in the face of danger, in the face of ill, there are survivors who are here to speak that truth no matter how powerful the opponent. I welcome that. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here in front of you, honoring our memories. This year marks the 22nd year commemorating our genocide. The genocide that was committed against Tutsi. That was 1994. It was in April. It started by the shot of the brain of the former president, Habyarimana, and in the morning of the seventh, so many families, neighbors, parents, friends, they were killed as they were not humans. And they were killed by humans. The genocide was committed by Rwandans. I don't blame the outsiders, if I may say so, but the genocide was committed by the Rwandans. Even though they had <coughs> help from other external pressures, the French government, Belgium, and even the entire world ignored the Rwandans while they were being, being killed. The genocide itself, by definition, is an intentional killing or destroying a group of people, or either partial or total. If, because they belong to a certain group, to a certain race, a certain ethnicity, religion, or even a geographical location. <coughs> and this month of April, so many genocides have occurred in Rwanda, Armenia, Jews, and even Bosnia. 
So the month of March of of April, it is a month that I will call it, it was the dark moment of the world. What happened to us is an unspeakable. I lost my entire family. Father, mother, and all my siblings. But I'm happy that I, I survived. I don't call myself a victim, but I'm a survivor. If I call myself a victim, then I'll be in a weak position. I won't be able to speak because I will be feeling always in fear of that one who wanted to kill me, who, who wanted to shut me off, to shut me down. But I still have that courage to be part of the world, to teach the world that hatred is no longer a word that we should be putting forward. I say that the world ignored Rwanda while they were being killed. The UN had more than 2,700 troops in Rwanda. And by the death of, I guess, the 16th of April, when Romeo Dallaire, the Force commander said the genocide was, was occurring in Rwanda. The UN Security Council voted, and I guess I know at 100 percent vote that they should withdraw all the forces, and they only deployed 200 people. Belgium, they withdrew their forces. It was in the in the in the in the happening of the genocide that was ignorance that was even say kill kill them. They don't they don't deserve, they don't deserve a life. Between 800 and a million Rwandans, they've been killed. Kids, mothers, fathers, without any distinction. <coughs> At least 250,000 of women, they were raped in just three months because the genocide took place in April the 7th and ended by July 4th. That's in a period of 100 days. If we make it in numbers, nearly six men, women and children were murdered <coughs> every minute of every hour of every day. I, as law makers, policy makers, <coughs> I will urge you to think about it, to think the lives that we lost and fight against any genocide ideology. Fight against any genocide denial. This is the time that people are saying it wasn't a genocide. It was just massacres. Hutu killed Tutsi, then Tutsi killed Hutu. And that's wrong. It was premeditated, it was planned. And they have even ways of executing without forgetting the kids, forgetting even the unborn kids. They, they were 
trying even to see how the unborn babies would look alive by just cutting them into pieces. By they did so horrible things. Hutu, they said they wanted to see how even private parts of Tutsis looked like. They raped <coughs> dead women. They lost him people. They were like animals. And today, back home in Rwanda, it's the remembrance of the Hutu that were killed because of the their resistance to participate in the genocide. One of them was the Prime Minister Agar Uwiringimana, who was killed on the first day because she was opposing the regime that was going to be killing Tutsi. So Hutus also died in that era of the genocide. So the 13th of April, they remember political leaders Hutu that they were brave to say no to killings, no to genocide. I I may say that the crime of genocide was first recognized in 1944 by the trials of Nuremberg by the Jews. I'm not a, a lawyer, I'm not a legal person, but by the legal definition of the genocide, the two elements are, are fully recognizable. The mental element and even the physical element. The mental element, that's the intent of destroying another group in the whole of Nepal. The physical element, those are the acts killing them, causing serious harm, deliberately inflicting the group, the group on group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in the whole of Nepal, imposing, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, and even forcibly transferring children to the group, of the group to another group. Some of our siblings, they opted to be called Hutus, to survive. That was the moment of survival. Um, I have two short movies, but I will just use one by today. But after all the talkings, after all we do, after what we what we say to the entire world. I will ask myself, where are we now? Survivors of, the, survivors of genocide, what are we doing? How are we surviving? Are we surviving? Are we living? Or just dead? But my answer is no. We still live, and we still live for a for a purpose. To make this aware, to make this a, a lesson to the others. When I see what is happening in the world, even though the world said never again, 
it wasn't never again. It is still happening. Still happening in Burundi, that's our neighboring country. It's still happening in Sudan, Darfur. Still happening, even what, what is ISIS is doing, <coughs> it will be called genocide later, after people have been buried or died. And this is insane, it's absurd, it's ridiculous. We should do something to stop that. We should do something to say no. What happened to others, what happened to us, can happen to you. Genocide ha doesn't have barriers, doesn't have borders. If we don't stop it, <coughs> It will come to you. And I will invite you to watch that small movie. And this one is about a surprise. And it was produced by Benchumele. <coughs> it's a German television that was produced. 20 years after <coughs> that in 2014. It shows nowadays how is to survive. April is when the wet season begins in Rwanda. But the rain brings back memories of the genocide that took place here 20 years ago. Starting in April 1994, at least 800,000 people were murdered in just 100 days. Two decades on, the Londons are still dealing with the atrocity. For Jean Cabisa from the capital Kigali, the rainy season is a difficult time. It reminds him of what happened to his family. <laughs> the rain makes me think of having to run away during the genocide in April 1994, said Jean. I had to hide in the forest. Those who survived were completely exposed to the rain. We didn't know how to protect ourselves against it. Seventeen of Jean's relatives were murdered, including six of his children, his wife and his mother. He lived in hiding for three months. Afterwards, he tried to rebuild his life. I put this house up after the genocide, he says. Here were the grasses. There used to be buildings all over here. They were destroyed. The ones up there I built from scratch after the genocide. Twenty years on, Jean still can't imagine reconciliation with those responsible. Up until two years ago, people would throw stones at his house. Those who murdered his family and burned his property are in jail, but their relatives live all around him. We don't get on well with each other, he says. In the Kachacha court, not one of the perpetrators asked me for forgiveness. That's troubling. Even though the government wants reconciliation, it bothers me that nobody has asked for my forgiveness. His biggest worry is what will happen to him when his remaining children get married and move away. He'll be left alone here, near the families of the perpetrators. There are similar situations all over Rwanda. This is the church in Niamata, 30 kilometers south of Kigali. 
During the genocide, 15,000 people fled here, seeking sanctuary inside. But Hutu militia stormed the building and murdered nearly all of them. It's now a mass grave and a memorial. There are 45,000 people interned beneath the church. Remains of those killed in 1994 are still being found in the area. When they are discovered, they're brought here. The crypt is cold and it smells of mold. Bones serve as a memorial. Their message is that the crime shouldn't be forgotten or denied and should never happen again. Some of the skulls reveal how crude the weapons were that were used against the victims. Every day, Anita Uenitsa shows visitors around the site. They cut this door because it was it, it the only way to this church. <coughs> and under that, to feed them by everything, every weapon. You see, for example, use the grenade just to open. In the roof, you see the fragment from, from this grenade. I think you see how they tie the door. Yeah. Inside the church, we have the clothes of victims. Most of the massacres during the genocide took place in Catholic churches. Hundreds of thousands of people fled to their priests, thinking the clergy would protect them. But many of them were simply handed over to mobs. In some places, the murders went on for days. Church altars became places of execution. We have uh, examples of weapons used, like machete, spear, and other things. That use that to kill the people. We have uh, the rosary, former ID, for showing how former government identified the person by tribe. You see the two tutti and the two here. The brutality that took place inside the church left its marks here. And on this baptism, the blood was full because they cut in the head like a kitchen there. This is the side of children's. Uh, after I used the main bomb inside the church and the other things just to finish them, they take the baby everywhere here in this church and smash them against the wall in this side. You see the blood on this wall? There were so there were so many here on this wall. The government is still trying to foster reconciliation. On an official level, it no longer makes any distinction between Hutus and Tutsis. <coughs> We've traveled to Nianza in the country's south, once the seat of the Rwandan monarchy. Today, it lies on a main thoroughfare for traffic to neighboring Burundi. Most people here live off the land, and as in other places, victims and perpetrators live side by side. <coughs> Monique Mukaminega and Console Nerandorero farm soya beans together. It's a remarkable partnership. Console's husband was convicted of playing a part in the genocide. In 1994, he looted Monique's parents' house. Despite this, the two get on well together. But it wasn't always like that. Whenever I left the house and saw her house on the other hill, says Monique, I couldn't think of anything other than what had happened. <coughs> but she slowly made the first move towards an apology, and I was able to accept it. But before that, we couldn't talk to each other or meet. I was furious. 
You need God's help to say sorry, says Consolé. I asked myself for a long time how I could approach the victims of this horrible situation. When I first came, she was washing clothes outside her house. She brought me a chair. Even though it took us a lot of time, she made me welcome and we sat together and talked. Now things are fine between us. As well as an apology, Consolé has also given Monique some compensation. Among other things, Consolé's husband stole his neighbor's cow. Consolé wanted to make it up to Monique. Her cow was <coughs> pregnant, so she gave Monique the calf. The gesture was a meaningful one. Cows are prized in Rwanda. Having a cow is very important for us, says Monique. In our culture, cows bring a lot of advantages. Every family has to have a cow. Without a cow, you don't have milk. You don't have dung to put on the fields. For us, a cow is a sign of prosperity. <coughs> Monique and Consolé are an example of how reconciliation can succeed. The neighbors now live happily together without the need for court verdicts or government directives. Still, it wasn't easy for Monique to forgive. Monique says, when she first came to me and asked me to forgive her, I asked her if she thought about exactly what she was asking of me. She said she had. I believed her. But I asked for time to think before I really forgave her. Another challenge looms on the horizon for the two women. What will happen when Consolé's husband gets out of prison? Consolé believes that everything will be okay. Consolé says that he too will ask for forgiveness and that he said it was the right thing for her to give money the cow. Back in Kigali, many people are proud of how far Rwanda has come in the reconciliation process over the last two decades. The country wants to present itself as modern and focused on the future. Traces of the genocide are hard to spot in the capital. <coughs> this is Sant Famille Church, where 20,000 people sought refuge in 1994. Its priest at the time, Wenceslas Monyeshyaka, signed it with the militias and handed over many people for execution. Today, this Catholic church does not commemorate the darkest chapter in Rwanda's history. 20 years after the genocide, forgiveness and reconciliation are a major challenge and will remain so for a long time to come. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming, for the morning is. Uh, it was in the morning of April 7, and when I woke up, there was a group of neighbors who had come to our home. I was, I was with my grandmother at the time, and everyone seemed afraid. So I asked it why. And people said that the plane of the president had been shut down and that they were afraid that the Hutus were going to kill us. <coughs> and being the naive, optimistic child that I was, I still am, <laughs> I, I said there's no way that they can do that. But that later that day, a big group of people came to our home and my uncle 
was a prominent person in the community, so he, he tried to run, and his daughter followed him, and then I, I followed, and, and I, never, I never saw that sister of mine. And that they trust him, and I don't know what he thought, so he stopped and, and came back walking toward these people. And I decided to return with him, and we went home. He was wearing a jacket, and he asked them, can I go and put this inside? They said, sure, go ahead. And he, he went inside home, he left the jacket, and then he came back. He was a very tall man like myself, and they asked him to lay down facing the sky, and he did. And one of the guys cut his head with a machete. I was so scared, I just ran. My grandmother called me and said, yes, yes, I, I wouldn't listen to her. So I, I went, and I, there was, it, was, it was really chaotic, and people were fleeing, going to the church. And I joined a group of people, and we gathered at the church. This was a small church, and usually 200, 300 people would feed in this church. <coughs> but at the time, it saw over 4,000 people placed inside its walls. We could not sit down, and, and people took turns sitting down. It was, it was very hard, and people were so afraid. And the instinct of self-preservation had, had left us. And we were there for two days. And on the third day, the people who had been surrounding the chapel with all kinds of weapons, they, they began to, to do the killings. They, they threw some grenades into the church. And then when people were overwhelmed, they came in and they began to kill people with traditional weapons. And by some weird reflex, I fell on the ground and okay, they fought me for dead. But then I got stuck in a pile of dead people, like in a pile of bodies, and then people stuck there. I thought I was going to die there. And later in the night, I had a person who was moving, and I grabbed his pants, and he, he helped me out of this, this pile. And it was very fortunate because it was raining so much on that night. And then the murderers had left the roadblocks. And so this, I was so weak and this man put me on, the, on his shoulders. And we walked for maybe an hour. And then we went and, and hid in this big swamp. And this man knew the area so well because he, he had been there taking care of the, of the cows. So he, he knew where to go and we went there and we were hiding there for the next three months. And we basically survived on sugar cane. And you can imagine three months without food or taking a shower or something like that. And then finally, this man's feet began to, to, to swell because of the cold and he could not stand on them anymore. And he said, son, I'm, I'm so tired of my life. I just want to die. I'm tired of trying to protect my miserable life. And he said, I wish you good luck if, if you want to stay in the hiding. I, I can't do it anymore. And I knew so well that there was no way that I was going to survive on my own. And I decided to follow him. And he went to this home and he knocked at the door. And he said, I'm here. If you want to hide me, you can do it. And if he decides to kill me, you can do it. And the person said, no, the genocide has stopped. So it, the genocide had stopped, but we weren't aware. <coughs> and having survived, I had to it was hard, but you can imagine being a child trying to not even being able to find food. It was, it was really hard. But I also 
begin to think about it as you get old and decide what well, is that you want to do your life with. I said maybe I should think about how I could live the world, the world a better place. And that's how I went to school. That's how I decided to go to school. And you can't really understand all the things that happen, but I would encourage people to watch out for simple stories. And Rwanda is, is, is really a place with an amazing story because like one of the guys that killed my grandmother, my grandmother had hired him and, and, and worked for her. But then when the genocide broke out, this guy called Safari, he decided to kill my mother. And I've always wondered why he decided to do it, but it's and by the way, this is why it's, it's very easy for terrorist groups to go and report in those areas. Because if you have someone <coughs> with no education who is poor and you give them a gun, all of a sudden he, he, he gets social status. Now he, he has a way of imposing himself upon society. It's like you've, you've completely changed his life. And that's what happened to this gentleman safari. So he got a gun and, and he shot my grandmother. And he went to jail. And the government was overwhelmed. Like the government that stopped the genocide, they were overwhelmed. Because if you have all these people and you don't even have enough jails, you can, it will take 100 years to do all these trials. So the government said we have to find solutions to these problems. And one of the ways they did this was that they said, if you plead guilty, because we, they were not people were not even willing to go and witness to the court, because these are their families, because they almost killed everyone. And so the government said, if you decide to plead guilty, you can spend eight years in jail for killing, and then do another seven years of community service. And this gentleman <coughs> pleaded guilty, and he he. After like 10 years, he came home, and we had to live with him. And I always felt sorry for him, because I wouldn't understand how he got there. But there are amazing stories of forgiveness, of resilience, coming out of, of Rwanda. And I, I will finish with this story, and then if we still have a few minutes, we'll open the floor for a few questions. The year was 2001. I was visiting a friend of mine called Jane and her little daughter called Sheja. Sheja was a year old when the genocide broke. Her father worked for the United Nations Development for International, the US Agency for International Development and he went to the UN mission headquarters hoping that they would protect him. But the US and, and other countries came to rescue their own people and he was, her father was abandoned there to be killed. And her mother had told her what had happened to, to the father. And, and sometimes kids have a different way of thinking about things. So we were there, it was in 2011, in the wake of the 9-11 tragedy. And we, we were watching the, the, the way that the world was responding to New York and everyone sending gifts and so forth. And I was feeling extremely sorry for the, the, the victims. And this little girl, Sheja, asked me, Uncle, is a human life more valuable depending on where they were born? And I can leave you with no better question to think about. Thank you very much.
you based upon what I know about every person in this room. Maine Law is here with you. We are here with you. Questions for Felix? For Emmanuel? Um, so I was, in, I was in Rwanda a few years ago, and um, I was struck by the fact that everyone was telling me how much they love the president. Um, could you speak to that at all, the current president? Is it, was it real, or were people putting on a show for the tourists? Um, and they were also telling us how great things were now. And I, I felt like I wasn't getting beneath the surface. Yes. Uh, I won't speak for them. But I'll speak, I'll speak on my own. I like the president, what he has done. He's the one who led the liberation movement to stop the genocide. He was with others, so, but he was the leader of the RPF that took over the genocidal regime. And he deserved that. He deserved that pride. But beyond that, I think as a politician, he should do more. As we saw on the on this documentary, survivors are still hanging in there they still want more to do. There is no justice, as I say. There is no justice if there is no reparation. There is no justice if there is no proper judgment. And it's not even about only Rwanda, about Kagame, about the president. This concerns also the entire world. The UN ignored to call it the genocide while it was happening. They just went off. They just withdrew their forces. The international community as a whole, they failed. But him as a man, him with his army, they stood up and they did something and they applauded him for that. And the development, Rwanda has developed. But other games of politics, I'm not a fan. I'm not in that. But I applaud him for that. I will add this. The, the people of Rwanda, most, most people in Rwanda, they really see this president as their hero. Because there's, there's this narrative, like the West, failed Rwanda. Like Susan Rice is quoted saying, we don't want to call this a genocide in the year of election, because if we do and we are seen standing by and doing nothing, this might have some consequences on the election. And, and it's not like people didn't know. So there's this narrative. And he, out of the genocide, he, he, he told Rwandans, hey, there has to be solutions, African <coughs> solutions to African problems. And people like him, I mean, there are some disagreements, especially, that's, and that's why the West doesn't really know what to do with the president of Rwanda, because you could say there's no freedom of speech as we know it in the West, but his, his performing in most any other areas. Rwanda is one of the areas where women, women's rights, he's really serious about that. Like 63% of lawmakers in Rwanda, like on Senate, and they, they are women. And it's the, like the first in the world. Economically, Rwanda is doing really well. And, and people look at this, like regular people look at this and they say, yeah, he's, he's, he's a great president, he's talking about the genocide, he, he, he's doing well on all these economic 
indicators, and people genuinely like him. It's, it's not like they are faking. And, and, and people will say, well, but he's, he doesn't tolerate uh, opposition. But most people looking at what happened in the genocide and so forth, they don't think that matters so much to them. So they, they really like him. Would, ah, you, would either of you consider returning to Rwanda permanently? I'm an asylum applicant, and when you apply for asylum, you're not allowed to go back to Rwanda. You're not, about, you're not allowed to go back to your country of origin. Even though that applies, I only have the roots there, but I don't have any relatives. And I consider my family people I am with. Yeah, I can go there to visit. I can go there to see how things are as we go to Hawaii, as we go to Ocha Beach to see the beach. But I want to go there as something I have in my heart. I'm hoping I, I, I can because once you come here and, and get this great education, I think you owe it to your fellow countrymen to go and, and help if you can. So ultimately, I would love to, to be able to go back and, and do something to help in the communities. Um, I know many individuals are fleeing from Burundi and, and headed to Rwanda or there now. Do you have any idea what the general sentiment is um, about those individuals um, with government or with just the individuals in the country? What, what happened in Burundi, the, there was a war for so many years and then they had a peace agreement and they said that the, the president cannot run for more than two terms. And then the president who is in office now ran for the first time and the second, and then he tried to amend the constitution so he can stay in power. He wasn't able to do that, and then he said, I'm, I'm staying anyway. And he, ha he happens to be a Hutu, and, and Burundi and Rwanda, they, they, they are like same countries. <coughs> and he, he's been trying to make this a race conflict People have not been buying into this. But that's, that's what's happening. So like people, they, they've been killing people for peacefully demonstrating. And it's, it's actually troublesome. So it's, it's like the, the situation there, it's, it's really sad. One more question. I don't have a question. I just have a statement. Um, I'm a survivor, and uh, I'm a granddaughter of a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. And I just wanted to thank you for stating Armenian Genocide, um, which it is. And uh, thank you for your truth. Oh, there was one last day. Well, why don't we do this? I have because yes. we, have, do we have a plan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's do this. So please do not leave if you would like to speak with Felix or Emmanuel. But please let me recognize those of you who are visiting us, who are not enrolled at the law school, who have not walked in these doors before. Please let me recognize you. Raise your hands. This is your place as much as it is our place. You belong here. Please don't make this your first and last visit. This is what we do at Maine Law, and this is who we are. Thank you. <laughs>